It is my pleasure today to be joined by author Carrie Gress. She is author of the new book, The End of Woman, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. Carrie, thank you so much for being with us today to talk about your new book. (laughs) My pleasure. It's great to be here. Well, you are a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. You've authored 10 books. Mm -hmm. You're a wife. You're a mom to five kids. Talk a little bit about how you started researching and writing on the feminist movement. What sparked your interest? Yeah, you know, it's actually funny because when I was in graduate school, I swore I would never get involved in women's issues. I mean, I (laughs) I even said it out loud. And um, so I still kind of laugh that it's something that I'm interested in. But one of the reasons why I didn't like it was I felt like there was a lot of good content out there for women to sort of skirt around, uh, you know, the radical feminist movement. But so much of it was written very academically, and it was not anything that I could pass on to friends or family or to people that I knew that were really struggling with their their lives and lifestyles. And um, so anyway, it just was one of those things that just sort of came about. I just I started writing um, really about the very first – one of the first books that I wrote on women was about – um, motherhood and just how much motherhood transforms us. I think, you know, going from that experience of thinking that, um, you know, next week it's going to get easier with my my newborn. Next week will be easier. Next week will be easier. And then finally realizing, like, wait a minute, it's just maybe it's not supposed to be easy. Maybe this is helping me become a better person through um, these trials and these all these things that are pulling me out of my own sort of narcissistic c- cocoon that I had created for myself. So mm. anyway, it's, it's just been very gradual. But I... Um, yeah, feminism itself, I, I really didn't intend to take it on until, you know, in, in this huge way I do with this book, um, until I started looking into first wave feminism. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard so many people say, you know, feminism was hijacked in the second wave. And so I was just expecting to sort of dig into the first wave and thought, well, it's just going to be all these really nice, lovely things about women and, um, you know, much purer understanding of womanhood. And I, I was just shocked at what I found because it was so different. It was also so clear to me that what we're seeing in the second wave actually had its roots roots in the, the first wave. So that's really kind of the 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 arc of, you know, how we got to this point. And I think that's one of the most surprising things that I found as I began reading your book was we hear so often this differentiation between the waves of feminism and how different they are. And when you started talking about kind of this through line through all of them, it was like, wow, that's so fascinating. So I want to dive deeper into that in a moment. But before we get to that, I thought it'd be helpful to just first define some terms and starting with, you know, feminism. When we talk about the feminist movement, when we say that word feminism for the purposes of our discussion, what do you mean by that? No, I think that's a fantastic question because it's, it's used almost differently by every woman. I think. And, um, you know, the one thing that seems to be kind of common is this idea that that feminism is um, you're pro-woman. The problem is, of course, is that what I mean by pro-woman is going to be very different than what Gloria Steinem means by (laughs) pro-woman. And that's where things break down. Um, So I the definition that I work with now is really um, focused on three elements that are, I, I think, run through first wave, second wave. There are obviously going to be variations of this, and I'll go into those three in a second. There are going to be variations of it, and I think it's really incumbent upon people that still call themselves feminists to define what they mean because these three are so pernicious. But um, the first one is um, free love, which is I, you know, the end of monogamy and really the breakdown of the, the family. The second one is uh, what started out as being called restructuring society. Um, It later was called smashing the patriarchy. And um, actually, Engels had something to do with that. It wasn't this wasn't just some feminist idea. In fact, a lot of these ideas did come from men. Hmm. Um, So that's the other ones, smashing the patriarchy. And then the third one is just the involvement of the occult. Um, So those are the three threads that I found running, you know, throughout the first and the second wave. And certainly we're seeing it now. Um, and the third and fourth waves of uh, feminism. Um, so that's what I, I mean by feminism when when I'm using it in, in this context. Okay, that's so helpful. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's go all the way back then mm-hmm. to the beginning of yeah. the feminist movement. Yeah. And I, I love that you take us all the way back in the book to the okay. 1700s, and you talk yeah. about a woman named Mary Wollstonecraft. Mm -hmm. Um, You say that she's, and by many, she's considered the first feminist. Who was she? And why is she really considered Mm -hmm. the start of the feminist movement? 
So Mary Wollstonecraft was a woman that she um, was very much involved with a lot of the, the revolutionary ideas connected with the, the French Revolution. Um, she and Thomas Paine actually was one of helped her out. Uh, much of his help was quiet because he didn't want to detract from his other efforts. Um, certainly in the French Revolution and beyond, people think of him as sort of the first um, socialist, actually. Um, you know, he went from writing Common Sense in the United States and then just kept going more and more deeper into what we would now call leftism. Um, and actually, so she was very much influenced by him. And you can see that in her work. I mean, he wrote a book called um, a, a tract to defend the French Revolution called The Rights of Man. Well, she then wrote another piece um, in response to Edmund Burke, actually, who was writing against the French Revolution. But she it was called um, The Vindication of the Rights of Man. So she's following up Thomas Paine. And then she writes her kind of magnum opus or what people know her for, um, the vindication of the rights of woman, which followed on that. So it, it her her work follows in many respects a lot of the intellectual threads of the French Revolution. She was very much, um, you know, Talleyrand was someone that she was involved with, had a relationship with, and, and actually I think she dedicated the book to him. Um, so she's deep into that kind of thought. And but in the meantime, she's also she was in Paris during the French Revolution. She had a relationship with an American man. She became pregnant. They never married, but he actually told the US embassy that she was his wife, and so he she was actually spared from the guillotine because of her American affiliation. Um so she had this child daughter out of wedlock and moved back to England, and then from there she ended up um meeting again a man that she'd already met through Thomas Paine, um a man named William Godwin who was at the forefront of the anarchist movement and the end of monogamy, the free love movement. He just thought marriage was this kind of slavery. And he was kind of known throughout England and France and, you know, to, in more radical circles um, and had kind of a celebrity because of it. So she marries him after they get pregnant also. And they have Mary Godwin, later Shelley, who was wrote Frankenstein. Um, so what she set forth was really kind of this French revolutionary, you know, crush everything, get rid of patriarchy, get which you, what I guess you, you would call um, the hierarchy in the church and in the military and all those kinds of things. Um, and she's trying to, you know, kind of create this equality among men and women. And so that's really the, the first spark, you could say, that that set off the movement from there. Um, so, yeah, she's a fascinating character. She herself had horrible parents, really incredibly awful example of what men and women should be. And I think that that kind of comes through in her work as well. Um, so, yeah, she's a very colorful woman. She died in childbirth, actually, with when Mary Godwin was born. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the end of her story at that point. And, at that, and after that, of course, the story moves on, a feminism with Mary Godwin Shelley and and Mary Shelley's husband, um, Percy Bysshe Shelley, the poet, the, the well-known po poet who integrated a lot of Mary's ideas. So how did her ideas then go um, and translate yeah. into these other things, the, the other things and, and really those yeah. waves first, yeah. obviously, starting with the first wave of feminism right. Um, right. and moving along? Yeah, well, this is where I think it's really interesting because I, I think very few people realize that feminism, these three pieces, the occult, smashing the patriarchy and free love were all came together in the work of Percy Shelley. Hmm. Um, in his poetry, he was trying to create what he called the women's revolution. So he's taking ideas from Godwin. He's taking ideas from Wollstonecraft, putting them together, adding his own. He had this, I mean, he was, this was a barbaric man, actually. He was very, he was involved in the occult. Um, there's this whole string of suicides of women <laughs> that he had seduced, inc including his wife, um, hmm. had committed suicide, um, his first wife. Um, so he was really an awful man, but this what 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 he saw was kind of the the vision of Mary Shelley's parents, which was you know this women's revolution where there's no monog monogamy, there's no this marriage, you know all of these things are just erased, and people just live this bucolic life, um, you know, without any of the, any reference to their human nature. And he he concocts this actually interestingly around the same time that his wife is writing Frankenstein. He's developed. He develops this character named Sithna, who is basically the the first independent woman in all of literature. She has no husband. She has no children. Uh, the one relationship she does have is to Satan, um, and this woman becomes kind of the the model in the minds of of, of 
later feminists in the 1800s, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, you know, as the movement is is moving forward. So he's the one that kind of put his stamp on it and made it, you know, gave people some someone tangible to think about um, in these very new and radical terms. I'm just so fascinated by this because I, mean, I I have been in the journalism space for for quite a few years, and I've interviewed so many people that that write and talk about feminism. I yeah. co-host the Problematic Women podcast. Um, right. I've never heard anyone bring up the the uh, occult roots mm. within the feminist movement. How did you discover this, and why yeah. why don't people talk about this? Yeah, no, I mean part of it is is it feels old and unimportant. I think that's some of it. You know, it's 1800s. Who cares? You know, and I, I think we also have this sense of the 1800s as being a very pristine time, you know, sort of Victorian mores and whatnot. And, I, you know, I can tell you my research sort of blew all of that out of the water in terms of prostitution, abortion, um, you know, all all this unfaithfulness. I mean, it just was everywhere um, I looked. But, um, you know, I, I had already sort of started seeing pieces of it. Um, the one, There's one book that brought a lot of the elements to light uh, for me, when, and I discovered it several years ago, and it's called Satanic Feminism, and it's by a, a Swedish professor. Uh, it was published by Oxford University um, Press, it's in English, and um, you know, it's one of those books that when I first read it, I thought that he was against satanic feminism. And of course, the deeper I get into the footnotes and you know references, I'm beginning to realize like, no, he actually thinks this is a positive thing. Um, so it was really fascinating to read because he he goes through this period of feminism, very first wave feminism, um, you know, that most people don't touch, and is making all of these different connections, you know incredibly well-researched book. Um, so from there, that that provided me with something of a guideline or, you know, kind of a backbone for my research. But then I was able to dig into primary sources and secondary sources and start, you know, really piecing together the bigger picture of what all this means and, you know, the, the incredible damage connected with all of it. Yeah. So obviously, in our conversation, we're even using those terms, first wave, second wave, third, third wave of feminism. Is that the, the, the right way or, or do you think the most accurate way to talk about feminism? Because I think mentally, yeah. we all break it down into first wave feminism, good, yeah. second wave gets a little questionable, third right, wave right. is super yeah. radical. Should yeah. we be thinking about it differently? Yeah, I think that is actually a really interesting question. Um, I think that, you know, in my own mind, I don't actually separate them up that way anymore, partially because in the 1800s, what, you know, the occult is playing a very active role in the 1800s. Um, you've got the, the, um, great awakening in the United States. You've got seances. You also really see this connection. People, you know, electricity is happening and the telegram and, you know, all these ways people are connecting with people in long distance fashions. And so, something like a seance doesn't feel so crazy anymore. You know, they're just like these telephone poles between this life and the next. This is what they thought mediums were and mm. didn't think anything about, you know, having a seance and those kinds of things. So that that's a fascinating part. I think when you get to the 1900s, that the dynamic changes significantly because then you're venturing into communism. You're also venturing into the influence of Nietzsche and existentialism and, you know, all of these long names that I think blur people's eyes over. But, um, but I think that it fundamentally changed because feminism s started pairing itself easily um, with communism. Communism was worried about restructuring society and ending, you know, monogamy and the, the, the nuclear family. And they were atheists. So there was really just one piece, this occult piece, this atheist and occult piece that were different between the two movements. And I think that was easily overcome by the two groups, the communists and the feminists. And they realized that they had the same ends in mind and could work together. Um, so I, I think that happens. And then second wave really is just this explosion of what we now know to be the woke movement. You know, it's this, these Frankfurt thinkers that really injected the ideas of the new left and the Frankfurt School into the feminist movement. And you see a lot of overlap. Angela Davis is is a name that comes up over and over again. In fact, I just read um, Christopher Rufo's new book, um, The American Cultural Revolution, I think it's called, mm -hmm. which is excellent. But it was really interesting to see how much Angela Davis played in his trajectory. And, you know, there's overlap, of course, with, with feminism as well. So, uh, and I think everything just spirates out of that. I don't think you have further waves from that. I think it's just all a big 
mess of, okay. you know, um, and, and answering this question. I mean, maybe a better way to sort of bring all these pieces together is to say the question the early feminists were asking was how do we make women more like men? And mm -hmm. if we look at it through that lens, then all of a sudden sort of the last 200 years make sense and we see – you know, they are trying to make us men. And we see that happening biologically now. It, you know, we can use, we have the technology to turn our bodies into something that appears more masculine, even though it can never be done thoroughly. Um, but yeah, I think that that kind of bridges these pieces and connects them together in ways that might be difficult to see sometimes. But that fundamental question, I think, is how you can sort of see the tweaking going on. And now even the infighting between those who are for trans and those who are against trans. It's just the, the ideology is really turning against itself. Yeah. You write in the book, The End of Woman, that um, feminism, the feminist movement, their failure at its root is a misdiagnosis mm. of what actually ails women. Yeah. How has the feminist movement misdiagnosed yeah. what is ailing women? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, partially because we can see we can see by the, the fruit of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll go back to giving you an answer in a second. But I want to just point out it hasn't made women happier. It, you know, we see women are more depressed. Suicides are higher. Suicide rates are higher. Divorce rates, even things like STDs, you know, all of these are sort of contributing to that. Um, but the, the solution that feminism has offered is really one, again, back to that idea of making us more like men. Um, femi early feminists looked at, at the struggles that women went through. And, you know, believe me, there were obviously there were enormous and awful things that women went through. You know, most women were not that many steps away from destitution or prostitution or, you know, something horrible, ha starving, um, horrible things happening to them. Um, so something had to be done. But they're, they're decision was to move in a way that that didn't edify or didn't help women certainly as mothers didn't help them um become better mothers didn't help them with their relationships with men with men and then of course over time you gradually see this just turn into power where feminism really becomes a question of of power and control and of course you know people can't live their lives that way in any kind of happy way when you're busy trying to be you know in control and in powerful power over things that you're not meant to be in power of. Furthermore, being told that your husband is your enemy and that your children are your enemy. Um, that's really what, what we've ended up with by asking that fundamental question. So mm. rather than saying, how do we help women, you know, bear their children or deal with difficult husbands, it's just to get rid of them. That, that's been really the solution is make us this independent woman that, that Percy Shelley drew out for us where we don't have any of these encumbering details and then we'll be, be really free. I think that's the, the, the message that I keep sending to us. So then, Carrie, if if the feminist movement was not the answer to mm -hmm. the ails of women, mm -hmm. um, how could women have overcome things like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, having limited options in their career and, and the right to vote without the feminist movement? Was yeah. the feminist yeah. movement a necessary evil? Yeah. I, and that's another great question. I think especially in light of the fact that a lot of us feel like we can't question the feminist movement because uh, you feel guilty. You know, I have an advanced degree and I work and, you know, all of those things that I, I obviously feel grateful for. Um, but I think that, that the reality is, is that the feminist movement actually has taken more from us than it has, has given us because it has just so narrowed who we are. Moreover, I think it, a lot of the things that happened could have happened very easily with like a natural law kind of reasoning. We didn't actually have to completely undo all of Western civilization in order to get these things. And, you know, look at what, what the cost has been. I think, you know, especially if we look at the abortion numbers, that I think that piece alone is really the most startling because feminism is so at the heart of you know, breaking that bond between mother and child and allowing abortion to be something that's that's conscionable. Um, there are actually more abortions internationally than there are deaths, human deaths or for any other cause um, together. So for like last year, I think there were somewhere around s between 60 and 64 million deaths internationally. Um, the Guttmacher Institute said there was something around 72 or 73 million abortions last year. So we're actually aborting more people than are actually dying from any other thing in the in the world, which you know is astronomical when you think about the ideologies of the past. You know, you think about Hitler, you think about Stalin, 
Now, you know, these numbers just eviscerate anything that they had ever did on, on a human scale um, in terms of, of deaths. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that um, it, it's another tactic and a, a way to sort of guilt women into thinking that we need to be grateful and so therefore we can't really look behind the curtain and see what abortion has, has done to us and what, what the movement has done to us. Yeah. You obviously address the patriarchy in the book. Um, your subtitle is How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. Right. Now, um, most women, when they hear that term patriarchy, they mm-hmm. their mind sort of goes to the suppression of women. So how did getting rid or attempting to smash the patriarchy mm-hmm. How do you argue that that actually is a harm to women? Yeah. Um, yeah, again, this is another hard thing. I've heard so many people define patriarchy in very, very different terms. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's a whole side story that goes with that. But I think that the reality is, is that what we've done is belittle men. And we have made men, you know, the, the goal, one of the stated goals, especially in the 70s of feminism, was to get rid of gender altogether. And a highly effective way of destroying the family and the authority of of a father in the home um, was really by destroying the fabric of society. So Kate Millett was a big proponent of this. You know, we need to promote homosexuality, prostitution, promiscuity, you know, all these things that were not, you know, key issues back in the 60s. And now, of course, they're very mainstream. Um, But along with that has come the the silencing of of men through feminism. So, again, we see this, this power play. Um, but men have a natural set of, of gifts that are, are different than men. And I think that that's what has, what's really happened when you set half of a population against the other half of the population. Again, this is where marks come in because men are the, uh, you know, by default, they're male, they are the oppressors, and by default, females are the oppressed. I mean, that's just the terms that they've been working with. Um, the most of us are sort of getting in the ether and, and sort of have mm-hmm. an expectation that's how it works. Um, by default, you know, they, they've done nothing wrong objectively, but that's they are just wrong because they're men. Um, so that that's, I think, the, the fundamental crux is when you set, you, when you pit, you know, the sexes against each other, um, what's really going to happen is, is, again, a further breaking of the family, further control over society because broken people are much harder to control than intact families are. Um, so there's a, ro- there's a whole underpinning of, you know, communist ideology, woke ideology, um, critical theory that's, that's running through this that I think a lot of us, you know, we're not familiar with. It it's, um, feels very foreign. And, you know, we've also been told that, uh, ma- you know, masculinity is, is toxic. Um, so it, it's hard to sort of parse these things out. And I try to make a lot of that clear in the book to just help women realize, like, no, th- this is intentional. And it, it, this battle of the sexes is, has not helped us because, it, you know, it's, it's creating all these women who, and, and maybe this is one of the saddest things is just the women that I meet who have really followed through on the feminist ideology. And they, you know, they get to their 40s, 50s, 60s, and they think, well, I have a lot of money and I have a good career, but I'm lonely. I, you know, my parents have died. I don't have children. Um, you know, there's this deep desire to love and be loved. And, you know, it's too late for them to have children. And what what do we do at this point when when we've realized, like, maybe this wasn't what I, sh- what I really wanted. Maybe this was not the path I wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, so those, I think, are the 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 really sad stories is, you know, obviously God has a plan for their lives, but it, it's just hard to, harder to figure that out when you get to a point where you've sort of been painted into a corner by an ideology that you didn't realize was going to leave you in this situation. Mm-hmm. Well, you really do such a beautiful job, and I so appreciate that you parse out so much of this so thoroughly in the book, The End of Woman, and you alluded it to it just a moment ago, but um, I, I appreciate and I find it really fascinating how you do explain how the feminist movement has led to so much as far as what we're seeing now with the push of transgenderism and um, that it's, it's, not, it's not a coincidence maybe that we are yeah. where we are. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really just thought that that was fascinating that you explain, no, this is how we got here. And it's yeah. been a long time coming. Yeah, no, it's definitely been a long time coming. And I think, you know, one of the trends that I've been following just as an aside over the years, too, is just even what we're seeing with the the, the pet craze in our country. We spend mm-hmm. 
700 million dollars on pet costumes each year um i mean that, that's just an astounding amount of money and i you know i think it, what it points to in many respects is that women have this desire to mother someone or something um we even are seeing you know pet or plant parents now um and and i i think you know in on a certain respect it's very hopeful because it it means it hasn't been s- crushed out of us, you know, and not, we're not meant to mother just biologically. We're also meant to mother others psychologically and, and spiritually, which means we, we nourish them. We provide us a, a place of shelter and protection for people to grow into the, the people that they're meant to be. Um, if you're looking for a more specific definition of motherhood. Um, but, but that's one of the byproducts is if we, you know, you take children and grandchildren away from women, then this is not going away. This is something that's sort of part of the core of who we are and that's that's where we're seeing it so um yeah between pets and the um and the trans issue and you know all of this incapacity to really even define what a woman is all all of these things have been kind of on a slow burn for a long time and we're just they finally you know we're seeing the real fruits of them Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the book is the end of woman how smashing the patriarchy has destroyed us it is out and available on August 15th, but it's available for pre-order. Now you can get it wherever books are sold. But Carrie, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we could we could talk for like three hours because there's just so much that you have articulated so well in this book. So I just encourage our listeners to pick up a copy. Um, this is a fascinating read for men and women. Uh, so for anyone in your life who's who's interested by this topic, This is a must read. Uh, Carrie, thank you for your time and for being with us today. Thanks so much. It's been great to be with you. 